morning and welcome to everybody. Good morning to our online campus. We're so excited to have everybody here. Today is a special day. Does everybody know why today is a special day? Because it's Mother's Day. By a show of hands, how many mothers do we have in the house today? Wow. That's awesome. That's awesome. Mike Motes, I don't, I, I don't think you're a mother, but that's okay. <laughs> we love you anyway. I want to read a verse for you. Oh, by the way, Pastor JP wanted me to let everybody know that there are plenty of baked goods in the back. So if you need a snack before Pastor gets preaching, I mean, if you need a snack at some time between now, <laughs> amen. The, uh, the baked goods are $1 and the coffee is $2. I don't know if they're still doing coffee, but there's definitely some cookies and I can say that they are fantastic. So, but... I want to read from uh, Luke chapter 1, verses 46 through 48. And this is uh, the title of this particular passage called Mary's Song of Praise, the Magnificent. I'm going to read a little bit of it. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. I think back to uh, the story of Christ conception, his birth, and just how awesome and how willing Mary was to follow uh, God's will for her life and the Holy Spirit. And I just want to say that I'm not a mother. I'm, that's not my thing. But <laughs> I can say that to those of you who are, I'm positive, but the do, to those of you who are, have partaken in motherhood, even spiritual motherhood, to somebody who may not have been your own physical child, but someone that is you took under your wing. God bless you. And I'm, I'm, I'm of the generation that's going to call you blessed. You are blessed. And we are blessed to have people like you that are willing to be mothers to those who may not necessarily be flesh and blood, but who are spiritually connected to you. So thank you so much uh, for all that you do. We love you. And are we ready to get our praise and worship on this morning? All right. Let's join our, let's, let's put our hands together real quick. Just one name, 
Amen. One more shout unto the Lord. Come on, church. Come on. Woo! Hallelujah! Glory to God. Glory to God. You may be seated in the house. Wow. I don't know. And am I at the right church this morning? Man, what praise. What? I'm joking. Of course I'm at the right church. I am so excited to feel and the sense and to worship and do praise and to glorify next to you. I'm telling you something. God is up to something in our church. I don't say that as a, just as, as, as prophecy or, or speaking it forward and, and out of hope. I mean, God is up to something in our church. And if you're not feeling it this morning, I, I, I get some blood from the person next to you. Get a transfusion or something, all right? Because I'm telling you, the last, probably the last two months of our, our coming together and fellowshipping, even in our small groups here in great testimonies of what God is doing in miracles, and I need you to do me a favor. You know, I preached about six weeks ago on miracles. I think it's been about six weeks ago. And we were believing for miracles, preparing for miracles. I've had so many people who have approached me and said, Pastor, I prayed for this, and this took place. And, and I'm talking about miracles here. I mean, all answered prayers are miracles. But I'm talking about things that looked impossible, things that you were praying for, for healing or, or doors opening. And if that's you, I, I, I'm not a very good uh, historian. I, and I need to be because I think it's important for the for the legacy, I'm preaching on legacy today, the legacy of our church, I need you to document that for you. Give me a copy of it. I, I, have, I have tongues and interpretations of our forefathers, or our foremothers, I should say, it's Mother's Day, uh, in a folder of what has been prophesied over 60 years, maybe even 70 years ago, over this church. And we're starting to see the things that they prophesied and believed God for Coming to, fa- coming to pass in our body. And so I really need, need you to do that. Can you do that? If God's opened the door, performed a miracle uh, that we have prayed for, that you've agreed for, please, will you document that and get that? It's not so I can say, hey, look what God's doing. <laughs> it's so that we can, it's important that we know. Revelations tells us that when the enemy comes against us, that we're going to overcome him through two things. The blood of the Lamb. The word of our testimony, see. And we have really been praying for a lot of things in our, in our, in our church lately. And so God is doing some healings, healings and things like that. And I just give God the praise and the glory. Amen. Good morning, church. I'm so glad that you are here this morning. It's good to see the house almost full. And I know we've got a lot of guests here today. Welcome. We're so thankful for you to come, whether it's just your Sunday. You felt like, hey, I want to try out that little church on the, on the corner down there. I guess we're not on the corner. But we used to be at the end of the road, but now they've paved it on down. But, you know, thank you for choosing us today. We, I take it, we take it very seriously that you are in the house with us today. Our goal is just simply to set an atmosphere where you can encounter the living God. We get a little excited at times. I hope that's okay. You know, uh, God, God chastised me a long time ago when Alabama won the national championship a couple years ago before it became a normal thing. Before it became a normal thing, 
I'll never forget Alex and I, and I think Trevor were watching. It was late night. That's when they were still showing it on regular TV. And, and when they scored a touchdown to go ahead, I think it was against Clemson. I forget which one it was. Man, I ran 11 o'clock at night. I ran out my front door hooting and hollering through my street in my PJs. <laughs> you know what? I didn't care. And I'm thinking, Lord chastise me. If you didn't care about that, then why do you care about what people think about you when you get excited when I show up in your presence? Amen? So we're excited here. I am so excited, and I'm so glad you all are here. To our moms, thank you so much for being moms. You know, there's only two people in history that were ever in this world that didn't have a mom. Adam and Eve didn't have a mom in that sense. I wonder if they had a belly button. I don't know. It's things I, I ponder, but yeah, but hey, we all have a mom, and thank you. And, and I know that um, I'm going to make light of some things here in just a moment before I go into my message. I also am very sensitive to this. There's folks in here today who this is your first Mother's Day without your mom. I want you to know I, my heart goes out to you. And I hope that uh, as I preach this message on legacy, uh, that it minister to you as, as, as well, because especially to you today. Amen. I still have my mom, the privilege of having my mom. This isn't about me, but I still do, although my mama doesn't know me most of the time. So my mama physically is here, but emotionally she's not here anymore with that, that dreaded disease that... Uh, uh, that has just taken her mind. So I, I understand in some ways, but uh, not f- fully as you do. But hey, my heart goes out to you, and I just want you to know um, that I am praying that today you have fond memories of mom. Amen? Amen. Well, before we get started, let me get my glasses out here. Um, I went over to Dope Campbell Stadium this uh, Friday for district council, and they uh, seen all these young pastors with all these different colored glasses on, and and so I thought I need to get me one so I could look hip. So, but no, actually they gave these to me in a, in a gift bag. I thought, hey, I kind of like those a little bit there, you know. But uh, anyhow, you know, as I, I was there, this has nothing to do with my message, but I, I want to share this with you. As I, um, as I was at Dope Campbell for our missions dinner, great missions luncheon, our, our, our district, our network, we're calling it network now, did $6.94 million for missions last year. Amen. Give God glory. Amen. We were, we were a part of that. We were a part of that. And I just want to say thank you for your faithfulness. And we was there and I was looking. They had the grass pulled up in the stadium because of their re, they're getting ready to returf it for football season. But I thought about that, that stadium, although it was empty. I thought about what it looked like um, on football day when they're, on Saturday. And there, there's, there's two things um, that really uh, got my mind. One of them was... Is this what heaven's like with those who have gone before us? Those heroes of faith as they root. I just thought, I mean, I just thought, I really just, man, I wonder what that stadium looks like today. And, of course, many of our moms, as I was referring to, are, are there rooting us on. So, anyhow, let's, let's uh, really quick turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 29 as you do. Just some real quick reminders of you, uh, to you that our uh, First Responders Appreciation Dinner, we've partnered with the Bear Creek Community Group. We're, we're hosting it. We're not hosting. They're, we're hosting the site. They're doing all the work. Some of our folks in our church are volunteered to help out with that. But that is next Saturday from 3 to 6. Uh, the lunch is $5. It's kind of a come and go as you want to. All the proceeds are going to honor our first responders to a nonprofit organization to honor them. I have tickets. You just see me. I didn't want to put someone out in the foyer. If you, need, if you really would like to come, I got tickets. Uh, if you can't afford tickets and would like to come, come see me, okay? I, I bought some tickets ahead of time and just want to make sure that we honor these first responders. Also, next Sunday evening, I am so excited about this. Uh, we meet three times a year with our Bay County section of the Assemblies of God. And next Sunday at uh, Callaway Assembly of God, we're having our quarterly come together. Our guest speaker is going to be my pastor. Uh, our superintendent, Tommy Moore, is going to be speaking. The emphasis, all the groups, we're going to have children's ministries going on, youth ministries going on, adult ministry going on, and all three of them is going to be emphasizing the Holy Spirit as we approach uh, Pentecost Sunday. And so I, th- I know it's going to be a great time. If you like snacks, you like sugar, you come at 4 o'clock. We have a fellowship at 4 o'clock. And the idea is to bring all of our churches together so we can see each other. We, we've, we've probably worked with some of these folks. You may have worshipped with some of these folks from other churches, gone to other churches, what have you. It's a time to come together. And then at 5 o'clock, and, 
And we purposely pick 5 o'clock because of the fact that we know that some people cannot drive it after dark. And so we purposely have picked it early. So you come and we try to be timely. We try to be timely. We're, we, it's, not, it's not like days of old where there's a lot of hoopla. And I, and I shouldn't put it that way because I think uh, we, we had well intentions. But it's not like everybody's got to get up and talk, things like that. We really do. We come together for a time of worship. And then Pastor Moore is going to be bringing a, a very timely word um, and emphasis on the Holy Spirit. Amen. Finally, before we get to our message today. And boy, I'm excited about this message. I hope it comes out um, the way God put it in my heart. On Mother's Day, we always take up a special offering. Well, we don't take up offerings anymore. You give. We just have the, our, our uh, hospitality team as you leave. Uh, we really didn't push this this year because it's become an annual thing. Um, but just know today is uh, we're, we're honoring moms as we've done every year with One Day to Feed the World. And so if you feel compelled to give what One Day to Feed the World is, it, wor- it works in conjunction with, it's an arm of um, Convoy of Hope. And what they encourage you to do is give one day's salary if you can't give what you can. And it goes towards feeding children around the world, even here in the United States that don't have food. It's a very impactful ministry. And uh, so if you feel led and want to be a part of that, just if you're giving on tithely, just put one day to feed the world, convoy, hope, anything like any emphasis like that. Uh, Christy will see that. If you want to give uh, through the offering, just make it out to Bear Creek and we'll make sure we send one offering in to one day to feed the world. We started this probably eight years ago uh, on Mother's Day, just thinking about how would it feel to be a mom and not be able to feed your children because of poverty, you know? And it's a, it's a, it's a great ministry. I've seen it in person when I went to Haiti several years ago and just want to be, uh, be a part of that. Okay, enough of the commercials. I think our sponsors have paid for the day. So we want to get started here with this message. But before we do, I got to share some funny things with you. You know, I'm not a mama. I know some of y'all have used my name in that context uh, all right, just go with me. I know you haven't. You better not have. You've thought it, but you haven't said it. I know. Uh, but I thought this is kind of interesting. The stages of motherhood. I think you moms can relate to this. At four-year-olds, our kids think this about mom. My mom can do anything. You know, isn't that true? Mom can do anything. By age eight, my mom knows a lot. By age 12, my mom doesn't really know quite everything, not as much as she thought she did. By age 14, God help us in those adolescent ages, right? Naturally, mom doesn't know that either. Age 16, mother, she's hopelessly old-fashioned. Yeah, you're kidding. At 18, that old woman, she's way out of date. By the way, no kid would say that in her mother's face, by the way. You may do it one time, right? Call her old woman, right? At 25, well, she might know a little bit about that. At age 35, before we decide, let's get mom's opinion. By age 45, wonder what mom would have thought about it. And, of course, at age 65, wow. Wish I could talk it over with my mom. Time goes by so quick, doesn't it? It does, really does. So, um, do I dare go here? Certain mom facts. These are certain mom facts about moms that have about young boys. How many of y'all have young boys or had young boys, all right? So, these are things you ought to know. A king size waterbed holds enough water to fill a 2,000 square foot house four inches deep. You should know that, right? You, sh- you should know that, right? Um, I definitely know this one. Uh, Trevor is my youngest son, uh, m- helped us learn this when we was living with my in-laws when we was building a house. When you hear the toilet flush and the words, uh-oh, it's already too late. It's already too late. Man, I had to clean out a toilet. Oh, was bad. It wasn't my toilet. Anyways, neither here nor there. All right. A six-year-old boy can start a fire with a flint rock, even though a 36-year-old man says, that only happens in Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. Certain Legos will pass through the digestive system of a four-year-old boy. No matter how much jello you put in a swimming pool, you still can't walk on water. And the filter does not like jello. All right. The fire department in Austin, Texas, has a five-minute response time. <laughs> Any of y'all ever play with father, fire? Dude, I did. I about burnt down the house one time, man. It's something about fire, okay? Here's a good one. The spin cycle on the washing machine does not make earthworms dizzy. <laughs> However, it does make cats dizzy. And because it does, a cat can throw up twice their body weight. So here you go. Things only a mother of boys can, little boys can know. 
Can I give one more? This is for in-laws. This is for parents, uh, uh, son-in-laws and daughter-in-laws. I thought this was a pretty good one. I've changed the names here to protect the innocent, though. So that way, they're, if, they, if it's a similarity, it's just by chance. Um, so, so there's this guy by the name of Alex who was a big-time game hunter. And so one day, he decided, hey, sweetheart, talking to his wife, Mallory, we're going to go to Africa on a big game Hunt. And Mallory says, you know, my mom, Lee, has always wanted to go to Africa. Can we take her? And of course, he says, of course, yes, let's take her. So they're there out there and, and on the safari getting ready. And that evening, uh, uh, you know, they all go to bed. The next morning they wake up and they find that Lee is gone. And Mallory is hysterical about where is my mom? We're out here in safari. She can't survive out here on her own. What are we going to do? So she goes and she gets Alex up and says, sweetheart, we have to go find my mom. We have to go look for my mom. And so Alex says, okay, babe. He sighs real heavily, gets his rifle, and he goes out. And sure enough, they come around the corner. And there was his mother-in-law, Lee. And between them and Lee, and with the rocks behind Lee, was this ferocious male lion just bearing down on Lee. And Mallory's like, sweetheart, what are we going to do? Shoot, 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 shoot. And Alex just stops and says, we're not going to do anything. He says, she goes, what do you mean? We've got to save mom. He, he goes, that lion got himself in that mess. He can get himself out. <laughs> anyways. Anyways. All right. All right. Are we there now? I know. It's like, Pastor, you, you, you had an hour and you've wasted 15 minutes on announcements and, and comic relief. That's okay. I hope today, not to be brief in the sense of being short, but just to be poignant to, to what this message is about today. I just want to first of all say just happy Mother's Day to all of our moms today. As you leave and honor our women's ministries has purchased a little candle for each of our moms. And if by chance uh, you're not a mom and you still want a candle, we purchased enough of them. Please, as you leave, our, our hospitality team will hand each one of you a candle as you go. Just don't play with them under, you know, you know, I don't want to go into my life story with candles and fire. I've already mentioned it. Just be careful how you use them. So, but anyways, well, this morning, um, I want to talk to you, and I want you to think, and, and, and listen, this message is for everybody today. I'm going to focus in, drill in on moms, okay? I'm going to drill in on moms today. I love the fact that we have a mom up here on the front row, and her little one is modeling her in worship this morning. Remind me of her name again? Cassie. Cassie. It's so beautiful seeing Cassie just raise her hands and worship God. But we all, we, I won't speak to all of us, because whether you're a mom, you're a dad, whether you're a salesperson, whether you're a nurse, uh, grandparents, obviously, uh, whether you're obviously in ministry, and I, and I really, I want all my educators, whether you are a secular educator as in a teacher or you're a Christian educator, I want you to hear the heart behind what God's laid on my heart for you today. But this is for everybody, and especially for our moms, because today I want to talk to you about your legacy, your legacy. Legacy meaning this, defined this way, the mark or impact an individual has had on people and places. The impact that you have had on individuals, people, and places. Whether you're just getting started out in life or been living as long as Brother Glenn's been alive, you are building and you're leaving a legacy. The challenge is, is a lot of times we don't think about our legacy until we get later in life. For me personally, I'm not, uh, as I keep being reminded, I'm not old. Of course, that's coming from people who are older than me, and I appreciate that. Uh, I've called old this morning by somebody younger than me, so I guess it depends on, on perspective. Uh, but as I'm getting older and I'm, and I'm realizing it in my own personal life, whether as a, as, a, as a husband of almost 35 years or as a parent, I've been a dad for 28, almost 29 years, um, a pastor, your pastor for 12 years, you start thinking, and you know, I've got fewer days ahead of me than behind me unless God really blesses me with a long life. And you really start thinking about your legacy, and especially moms. I, you may not think of it that way, mom, as what's my legacy, but you do. Sometimes you just kind of question about what is life? What is the meaning? Why, why have I gone through this? Why am I going through that? Why has my, you know, why have my kids been heartache to me if that happens to be uh, the path that you've gone down? Or why, you know, we, we think about this. Why, what have I done wrong? And I think about that. That's, I think about my wife. I'll use her as an example for just a moment because I would say my mom, but my mom's a perfect mom because she had the perfect child. So there's not a whole lot of negative from my mom's perspective. So I, I will speak about my wife, but I think about my wife. First, first of all, I do have a sister. That's right. And she's the reason why I was an angel. See, Brother Glenn in his Sunday school class didn't believe I was an angel, but my mama called me her angel because I was perfect. 
And when you have a brother and a sister, and I trust me, that are just anyways. I, anyways, I'll leave that up for you and your siblings to talk about. But anyhow, but I was, um, I think about my wife, for instance, and I'm not here to, 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 to necessarily to build her up, tear her down. Hey, Bree, we have a missionary in our midst. Hey, welcome. Thank you for being with us this morning. She is a missionary associate to Madrid, Spain. Welcome. Glad you've chosen to be with us this morning. Welcome. She could be with her mom. That's right. So, but think about Sherry for a minute. She's first. She's a wife. What what entails a wife? Well, she's she's my friend. She's my confidant. Uh, she uh, also is my encourager. She is my lover. She is my partner in ministry as my wife. Uh, but she's also she's also a mom. So that means although the caregiving is not as great as it used to be, uh, they don't make as Many messes my boys do, but they still make pretty big messes at times. Uh, but she, you know, she is there as, as, as a mom. She's a caregiver. She's an educator to my, my boys. She, she had the privilege of the first major years of my boy's life being the primary caregiver, which is kind of, I'm not saying it has to be that way. It's just kind of how things fall in the role of a mother when the children are young. I was so proud to see Brian this morning. Of course, Miranda's, Miranda's on crutches today, and Brian comes in. Brian Price comes in. He's got the baby in one hand, toting like a sack of taters. He had Miranda's purse around his neck here. He had a backpack on his back, and I think he had a cup of coffee in one hand. He was like multitasking this morning, right, helping mom out. But yeah, that's kind of the picture of mom. Sorry, Brian that you're the picture of mom, but that was a great, a great, great picture of what a mom goes through, right? Uh, she's the domestic engineer of most of the house. She's the cook. Uh, she's the Uber driver, young, and when, when our boys were young, you know? You think about this. She's also a, a daughter. She, in her life right now, she's taking care of, she's the, I won't say the primary caregiver, but of the, of the siblings. She does more to help her mom and dad out in their aging uh, years here and, and being a caregiver and, and trying to help them out, checking on them every day, going by and sitting. She also has chosen to work outside the house. So she, and, and, and so she has a career that she, she, she manages, so she teaches, and, and uh, many of you do the same thing. And then there's the pressure from the world that falls upon ladies in particular, and especially moms. Uh, there's a lot of things, especially with social media, critical about this, critical about all the pressures that the world puts on her to be this woman. And with that, it makes us think about what is life all about. There, there's definitely triumphs, but we have our struggles, and because of our many struggles, we wonder, are we making a difference? And I don't want to see the hands of moms or people in general who says, I sometimes wonder if we make a difference. I'll be honest with you, there's times in ministry I wonder if I'm making a difference. And so we struggle this way. It is, 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 am, I, am I accomplishing all that I should and all that I could in life as a, as a mom, as a woman? So this morning what I want us to do is I want us to look at somebody in the Bible uh, who is a major player. Her name is Leah, but she's very obscure. She's, she's not necessarily talked about uh, in the best light at times. She's kind of a, a supporting actress, if you would, of the story of Jacob. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, it's a very important story. And her life is marked with tremendous ad adversity as we, as we read about it. And like many of us, she wondered, Lord, why am I here? Why did you put me on this earth? Why have you given me such a heavy load to bear? Now, while Leah's story is from Genesis chapter 29 through 49, her legacy, and we're going to get to her legacy after we kind of look through the first couple of years of her life. Her legacy literally spans throughout from Genesis chapter 29 all the way through Revelation, to the end of Revelation, when you look at her life. She has a tremendous, a tremendous legacy. And I want to use her life this morning to encourage all of you, but especially I want to encourage our moms today. There is a strong message of encouragement here today. Uh, and I'm just so thankful that moms don't eat their young like some males do, dads do in the, in the animal world, right? And can I say this in light of everything that's happening right now in our Supreme Court? Mom, thank you for choosing life. Thank you for choosing life. Amen? Thank you for choosing life. And please be in prayer about that if you would. All right. So, many of you, uh, excuse me. Let me get my train of thought here. That kind of threw me off there. Many people don't get all that they want in life. 
We all set out with dreams. We all set out with ambitions. We all set out with the ideal life. We kind of all start off with a fairy tale life, don't we? We all have this idea of what we want to be and who we want to be. But we don't always get what we expect from life. Leah certainly didn't. She certainly didn't. Her name in Hebrew means weary or tired. Or it may possibly mean wild cow, depending on, on the context that you're using it. <laughs> wild cow. All right? And as compared to her younger sister, Rachel, which means ooh, not as an ooh, but E-W-E, as in a young female sheep, it may suggest that Leah was not as attractive as Rachel. In reality, the first scripture we're going to look at here in Genesis 29, 17, actually says that very thing. It says, Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful. What a way to contrast two girls, two ladies. What do you notice about her? Well, she's got weak eyes. Her name means crazy cow, wild cow, right? But Rachel means, ooh, you know, hey, something pretty. Look, what do you know about Rachel? Well, just look at her. She's beautiful in every, every, every way, see? Now, weak eyes could mean a number of things. It could mean that Leah was nearsighted. It also could mean that she was cross-eyed. We're not really sure. We don't know. But what we do know from this Genesis account is that Jacob was not attracted to her. He was not attracted to Leah. He was very much in love with Rachel, the younger daughter. Many of you see yourselves as Leah. Not in necessarily physical realm, but you see yourselves as Leah. Someone else is better, more attractive. Their kids are better behaved. They're a better wife. <laughs> you know, they're a better homemaker. And they earn a lot more money than I do. I'm, I'm Leah. They're, they're Rachel. For Jacob, Rachel was love at first sight. If you know the story of Jacob. But Jacob, the schemer, met his match when he was introduced to his uncle Laban after meeting Rachel. Like I said, I don't want to talk to you for, time, for the time's sake. Go back and rehash the story of Jacob. But Jacob was, because he deceived his brother. I said I wasn't going to, now I'm doing it. Just go with me here. Jacob deceives his brother, has to flee for his life. He goes to his uncle Laban. And, and of course, when he gets there, he has found a wife. His, his servant has gone before him. And the woman that he falls in love with is, is Rachel. But Laman has another plan. As, as Jacob comes to Laman and says, look, I want to marry your daughter Rachel. What can, or better yet, I want to go to work for you. And, and then Laman says, well, what can I do to, to pay you? And, 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 and Jacob says, hey, listen, how about if I marry your daughter Rachel? He says, you know, that's fair. That's fair. I'm going to let you marry my daughter Rachel after you have worked for me for seven years. So I only had to work for Sherry one year, and I got Sherry, all right? Imagine working seven years before you could marry the love of your life. So that's what he did. And he worked for seven years. And at the end of seven years, Jacob goes to his soon-to-be father-in-law, Laban, and said, Laban, I've worked my seven years. I'm ready to get married. I want to marry Rachel. And so Laban throws a big party. And back then, a wedding wasn't an hour and a half or two hours like it is today. It was a week-long celebration. And on the first night, the couple were to consummate their wedding. And so that night, Jacob, probably being a little tipsy, there's another reason not to get drunk. Other than the fact, the word says don't get drunk. All right, so he gets a little drunk. It's dark. They turn the lights off. It's after dark, right? There is no electricity. And so she comes in veiled. You say, how do you know this? Traditionally, customly, this is what I do. And so Laman switches Leah, the older daughter, for Rachel and sends Leah into this tent. And Jacob doesn't realize it. And so Jacob consummates, we got young ears in the house, the marriage with Leah, not knowing it. Until the break of day. Genesis 29, 25 explains it best. When morning came, there was Leah. When morning came, Jacob says, what in the world just happened? I don't have a memory of anything. What? How did this? I don't understand. And the goodness gracious. I, he, who did he? Right? <laughs> how do you explain it? You don't. So Jacob confronts his father-in-law, Laban, and Laban agrees, okay, I'm going to also give you Rachel. You can have both, which, there again, I don't know how the man could manage one wife. Yeah. Company take in consideration, you're such a sweet, sweet, wonderful, low-maintenance woman. <laughs> I don't know. 
I don't know. It's not Father's Day, okay? So, I mean, I guess I can throw myself under the bus. I won't, you know, I'm not going to throw Brother Glenn under the bus on this one, okay? Or Joey under the bus on this one, all right? But, yeah, he's like, okay, I tell you what, I'm going to let you marry my younger daughter, Rachel. See, the custom was you always married your older daughter first. That's why Laman did it. And so he says, I'm going to let you have Rachel too, but you've got to finish out the week, the, the wedding week. You have to finish out the week. Finish the wedding. You're officially married. And after that, I'm going to let you have Rachel on the eighth day, but you're going to work for me another seven years. So, so I mean, there, there's a price to be paid. I'm not going there. I'm not, no, I don't, that's not in my notes. No, Lord, I'm not going about the price being paid. All right. So after completing the marriage week with Leah, Jacob and Rachel were married. Listen to verse 30 here. It says, Jacob made love to Rachel also, and his love for Rachel was greater than his love for Leah, and he worked for Laban another seven years. So I want you to grasp the pictures. Ladies, how do you think Leah felt? Heartbroken? Come on. Heartbroken? Upset? This is for the ladies. You're not a lady. David, you're not a lady. I said ladies. I'm about to say, who's that dark-voiced woman? Ladies. Come Mad? Do what? Not good enough. Rejected. Used. Yeah. Maybe depressed, as we use that word today, full of anxiety. See, I, I, I want to put you in the story here. Guys, you got to somehow or another put yourself in the story. Pretend like your wife marries another man who is like a lot taller than you, Brother Fred. All right, come on. Brother Jerry, a lot more muscular than you, Brother Jerry. Okay, come on. All right. I'm trying to find someone that's... No, nah, I won't go there. I won't go there. All right. I was going to talk about intelligence, but I'm not going to throw my brothers under the bus there. All right? Yeah. Leah was forced through custom to obey her father and marry a man who did not want her. Then she suffered the embarrassment of seeing him marry her younger sister, Rachel, seven days after marrying her husband. And all Leah could do was stand by and say nothing. You hear that? Collective air being sucked out of this room. When you put yourself in the story, why? Why, Lord? What what good is this? What's, What's the advantage of this? Life was not fair for Leah at all. The circumstances in Leah's life were not within her control. And I think sometimes we struggle with that. Sometimes we tag ourselves, ladies, with things that we have no control over. Or we are allowed to be labeled about things in your life that you have no control over. See, her looks were against her. Her younger sister was more captivated, captivating. And her husband had sex with her but did not really love her, see? But one thing Leah had in her favor, however, was that her younger sister, Rachel, as we can tell from Scripture, was infertile. And Jacob had to return to Leah to bear children, which is a part of the customs of their days. So Leah became pregnant, and I really want to focus in on this, and gave birth to a boy whose name was Reuben, her firstborn. And Reuben means, behold, a son. Now, I'm not, listen, culture and customs have changed. I would love to have had a daughter. I always told Trevor he was a daughter I never had. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't place, love you, buddy. I don't, <laughs> I don't, we teased him for a long time that we dressed him up in dresses when he's little, which we never did. We really didn't. Um, there's a reason why Trevor's the way he is, and you can blame most of that on me. But, yeah, behold the son. Lee expressed the essence of his name this way. It is because the Lord has seen my misery, surely my husband will love me now. You see the praise in this? You see the the giving God the the, the recognition, but you also see her heart. Maybe now he'll love me, see. But he didn't. But nevertheless, she conceived again. And this time the the, the son bore the name of Simeon, which the name means heard. And Leah explains it this way. Because the Lord heard that I am not loved, he gave me this one too, see. See. Notice, Leah's talking about here, she she describes the Lord as the Lord sees her. And I I want our moms to hear this this morning. The Lord sees her and the Lord hears her. The Lord sees her and the Lord hears her. I'm going to say it again just for emphasis because the Bible does it for three times. The Lord sees her, 
the Lord hears her. See, still Leah was not loved by her husband. After giving birth to two sons, she conceived again, and this time she bore Levi, which means attached. Her explanation for the third son is this. Now, at last, my husband will become attached to me, talking about emotionally, because I've borne him three sons. In, in, in her explanation of the names that she gives her son, definitely gives you the idea of what's going through her mind, doesn't it? Everything's about, I just want to be loved here. I just, I just want my husband to, to love me. But that didn't happen this time either. By the time Leah's fourth son is born, she seems to have given up on Jacob loving her, and she names the boy Judah, which means praise. I love that. And here's the reason. This time, I will praise the Lord. Her faith in the Lord. Notice that. Each time a son is born, she refers to the Lord. The Lord hears. The Lord sees. And this time, it's about praise. Her circumstances may have brought her misery and lack of love from her husband, but her view of God was one of trust. One of trust. See. If you read the story of Jacob, Rachel, and Leah, you'll know at the end of seven years of of earning Rachel's hand that Jacob decides to take his family and take them back to Haran, take them back to his homeland. And in doing so, you'll find that Rachel goes back into the tent of her father and steals their false gods. But if you read that, Leah has nothing to do with that. Why? Because Leah is faithful to God, the one true God. See, her trust is in the Lord. She couldn't trust in her husband in the sense because... He really, she was just there as a, as a means to produce children for the family, for the clan. After the fourth son is born to Leah, Rachel gets upset. So what does she do? She can't bear children, so she gives Jacob her handservant, Bilah. Now, I'm not here to talk about right or wrong. This is not the purpose of this message, but that was a custom of their days and just gave Jacob, her handmaiden, why? Because part of a woman's identity was children, especially men. I didn't finish that thought, but boys were valued more than girls were. And so we see that. So she hands it to him, and Belah gives Jacob two sons, Dan and Naphtali. Not to be outdone, you're talking about reality TV? This is reality TV. Not to be outdone, Leah's womb temporarily has been closed. So she gives Jacob her handmaiden, Zilpha, and through her, two more sons are born, which is Gad and Asher. I mean, this family's growing pretty quick here. God now reopens Leah's womb, and she bears two more sons, Ishkar and Zebulun, plus a daughter named Dian, or Dinah. And finally, Rachel has Joseph. And one more son, as she gives birth to Benjamin in the city of Bethlehem, we find Rachel dies at childbirth. And through these two women and their two handmaidens is how the 12 tribes of Israel came to be, plus Dinah, the daughter. And I want you to see that. Now, I'm not here to debate whether these 12 boys and this young lady was, was really godly people. I, we, don't ha- we know there's sometimes that they obviously didn't act godly. I know there's times that I didn't act godly when I was growing up, and there have definitely been times that my boys have not acted godly. They've acted more like their mamas sometimes when they've been growing up. So, <laughs> See? But nonetheless, she trusted in the Lord, she feared the Lord, and her heart was towards the Lord. This is what I love about this. As we find, Rachel died in childbirth, but Leah obviously outlives Rachel. We're not told where Leah died, but we do know that she was buried in the cave, and I'm looking at my notes because I want to make sure I pronounce this as best I can, Machpelah, which was a cave that was purchased in Hebron by Abraham. And we know from Scripture that Abraham and, and Sarah, which is Jacob's grandparents, and Jacob's mother and father, which is Isaac and Rebekah, were buried in this cave. And we know from Scripture that this is where Jacob wants to be buried, and we know from Scripture that this is where Leah is buried. Kind of finish the story out for you. You know that the, there was a there was a a I'm trying to put all the dots together because I don't know how many of y'all know your Bible history, but over time the clans grow. Jacob uh, corrects his relationship with his brother. He he takes back goes back to the land of Canaan, and then because of a of a, a drought, they end up going to Egypt. Joseph is thrown into the pit, and they end up in Jacob. Jacob dies in Egypt. 
But he says, when I go back, when you take my bones back, it would be over 400 years, and they did it. I want to be buried, Genesis 49, 31. There Abraham and his wife Sarah were buried. There Isaac and his wife Rebekah were buried. And there I buried Lisa, and he's given him instructions. And that's where I want to be buried. Interesting when you think that. In the end, Leah has won Jacob's love. But looking back, we're tempted to say that Leah won a tragic and difficult life. And it was tragic and difficult. Yet Leah's story teaches us that the effects of your life cannot be measured within the time span of just a few decades that you're alive. And that's what I want you to focus on today, moms. Anybody for that matter. Focus on that today. Cannot be measured in your lifetime. Leah's story, like all others, fits into a large-range tapestry of God's weaving. Now, let's just look for just a moment before I close out. Let's just look for a minute. I, I know this ain't a shout me down, hurrah, hurrah. But let's look at Leah's legacy for just a moment. What was her legacy? Well, the priestly line comes from Leah's third son, Levi. From that line comes Moses, comes Aaron, comes Miriam. Without Leah, there's no Levi. Without Levi, there's no Moses. There's no five, five books of the Bible, the first five books of the Bible. There's no Ten Commandments. There's no Exodus from Egypt. There's no prototype of the role of the high priest upon which Jesus would model his intercessory ministry to the body of Christ. Without Leah, there's no Levi. and Without Levi, there's none of that. What a heritage, but it doesn't stop there. What a legacy, but it doesn't stop there. Centuries after Leah's death, the elders of Bethlehem pronounced a blessing upon Boaz. Remember Boaz, the story of Boaz is really the story of Ruth, the redeemer, right? The kinsman redeemer. And as he's about to marry Ruth, they, they come to him and, 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 they, and they bless him. And of course, he's a descendant of Leah. And they, and they come and, and, and they bless him. And this is what they say in Ruth chapter 4, verse 11. May the Lord, may, may the Lord make the women who is coming into your house, the woman who's coming to your home, like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. And when you look at that, Leah did far more to build up the house of Israel than Rachel. It was Leah's fourth son, Judah, who became the ancestry to King David and King Solomon. So without Leah, we don't have Judah, praise. Without Judah, we don't have Boaz. Without Boaz, we have no David. Without David, we have no Solomon. If we don't have these, we don't have the Proverbs. We don't have the Song of Solomon. We don't have Ecclesiastes. I'll get that out. The Ecclesiastes, I can't speak. I'm educated. My tongue can't keep up with my brain. It's that iced coffee. From Leah comes not only the high priest, the priest, the Levites of Israel, but also the kings of Judah, including some of the greatest kings of all time, Asa, Jehoshaphat. I told you I have another son. It's Jehoshaphat. We're going, I want one more son. Jehoshaphat, Uzziah, Hezekiah, and Josiah. I'm praying. I'm praying. If nothing else, I have a grandson. He's not going to answer my prayer. All right. Additionally, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel all appear to be priests and therefore descendants from Leah. I'm trying to point you out here that her legacy goes far beyond the few years that she had in this world, on this earth, as being the wife to Jacob. She, she played a major part. Nehemiah, Ezra, all these are all part of her lineage. Without them, think about how much of the Bible wouldn't be written. Think about how much of, uh, we wouldn't know about God. But through her, her legacy is found in this book that we so treasure and that we read and we strive to live by. See, That's her, her legacy. Ultimately, the key players in the Christmas story. I know it's the wrong time of year, but think about it. Hey, it's Christmas in May. Christmas every time of the year. Mary and Joseph belonged to Judah, the fourth son of Leah. And Elizabeth and Zechariah belonged to Levi, the third son of Leah. Their son, John the Baptist, likewise comes from Leah. Anna, the old woman in the temple who kept talking about that the Messiah was coming, who was prophesying over this, who blessed Jesus. She also comes from Asher, which came from Leah's handmaiden, Zifla. See, in summary, without Leah, there's no Judah. Without Judah, there's no David. Without David, there's no Jesus. Without Jesus, there's no salvation. The people of the Christmas story are mainly Leah's Family, offspring, what a legacy. What a legacy. Furthermore, in case you haven't quite received the message that God wants you to hear today, the spreading of the gospel to the Gentiles also comes from another of Leah's descendants, Barnabas. He came from the, the family of Levi, the tribe of Levi. And for all you that are maybe a stepmama or you have chosen to be a mama by adopting, 
Okay, this is something a lot of people don't think about. But think about this. When Rachel died, who raised Rachel's children? She had handmaiden, but Leah became their, their mother. Think about that. And so from, from um, Benjamin came the New Testament apostle Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament because of the influence she had in raising Rachel's children. See, what a legacy. You cannot measure the impact of Leah's life within her short earthly lifespan. You cannot measure your life in that way either, see. And neither can you judge things on the external appearance. Rachel was a good-looking one, but God looks deeper than the external looks. I, he looks at the heart. Leah had a heart after God. And because of that, what an impact, what a legacy she's had in our world even today. So what can we take away from Leah's story? We need time and distance to fully understand what God is doing through our lives. We can't see it right now. It's only after we're gone. This is my personal theology. I know one day as a child of God, I'm going to stand before Christ and give an account of my life. My salvation won't be in the balance. I'm saved. I'm fully saved. We'll be fully saved on that day. But we're judged for what we did and didn't do. And I think part of that judgment, part of that time, is God's going to reveal. And I think part of it's going to be, this is what your life, this is what I did through your life because you made yourself available. That's true about every one of us. Every mom, every dad, every teacher. Come on. Whatever you did with your life, whatever your calling is. And motherhood is a calling. Motherhood is a calling. You better be on your knees and pray and ask God's help if, if you're a mom. It is a calling. Leah had no idea that her trials would result ultimately in a priestly and kingly line or that a great deal of the Bible would have been written or underwritten through her children, through her lineage. See? And most of all, she had no idea that the Savior of the world, come on, would come through her. Her DNA was in Jesus. Jesus. Her DNA was in Jesus. What we do and how we live matters to God, and it matters to the generations to come, and it matters to your children, and it matters to your, great, your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. And I put this down as an example. You know, I looked at my life as I was preparing this and looking at my, my there is a legacy coming after me, but my legacy is part of somebody else's legacy, if that makes sense. And I, can, I don't know much about my lineage. I, I know I came through Daniel Boone. If y'all didn't want to know that, Daniel Boone was, no, Davy Crockett, excuse me, Davy Crockett, excuse me. Davy Crockett is one of my ancestors. If you want to know, you're welcome, by the way. You're welcome that he fought off there in, um, there in Texas, at that, you know, the Alamo. You're welcome. You're welcome. If you want to play tribute, do it later for me, okay? So I really don't know much about my heritage. But what I do know is that my, my mom Altice was a godly woman. I know that uh, she, raised my, she raised 12 kids. I don't know how many of my aunts and uncles, to be honest with you. I don't know any of them. I've met two of them in my lifetime. Um, but I know she raised them for God. I had a very ungodly grandfather. My papa Tease was not godly. He was a drunk. But even through it, she never left him. I mean, I, I looked at that and said, man, it's almost like Leah. I mean, although Leah didn't give birth to 12 children, but basically, that's, basically my grandma Tease was... Nothing but a birthing machine and, and, and something to be abused and to be pleasured by. And I think about that and, and how she loved the Lord. It's no, I remember when I was in sixth grade, this, God, this woman was so godly. I know God listened to her because one day we were fishing and we weren't catching any fish. True story. And we're sitting, she was old and feeble. She was obviously, my dad's the youngest or next to the youngest, so she was already very much up in age. And we weren't catching no fish. And she just said, I'm tired of this. And she said, in Jesus' name, fish, I command you to buy. And Fish bit. Not only bit, she caught the fish. Biggest brim I'd ever seen. She put it in the basket, and she did that three or four more times. And every time she did it, she caught a fish. She says, well, I'm done. I've got enough for a meal. And you know, you say, that's silly. That's my memories of my grandma, though. That's the memories. She was a full-blooded Cherokee Indian, beautiful woman, very quiet. But yet she loved God, and everything out of her mouth was praise. I think of my, my, my grandmother on my mom's side. Her name, we called her, not as a joke, her name was Big Mama. Because Big Mama was the Big Mama. In other words, you had her, and then you had all the, the undermamas, so to speak. And I can remember, 
it, it was tough. I would, I would spend a week or two weeks every summer. I think my mom and dad just kind of was glad to get me out of the house for a couple of weeks there. And I'd go spend the summer with her a couple of weeks in the summer in Selma, Alabama, which I have, I'm telling you, it's the hottest place on earth. It's the hottest place. There was no AC. And she lived in government housing. She was very poor. My grandfather Roberts was another. He was a drunk. He wasn't a godly man. Abused her. But she was faithful to him. And she raised her kids in church. I remember every summer I'd go to be with her. She would, I say drag me. She would take me to church. She was a church God woman. Strong church God woman. Uh, I remember her hair being up in a bun. She always wore a dress. Long dress, long sleeve. She was a godly woman. woman except for from 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock every day during the week because she had to watch um, General Hospital. But that's, that's okay. God dealt with that, I'm sure. She'd kick me out of the house the hottest part of the day. Tony, it's time for you to go play on the metal playground. They were metal. The slide was metal. The cr- Everything was metal. So, <laughs> so, yeah, she couldn't be, she didn't want to be interrupted during her soap opera. But godly one, raised my, my mom, my, my aunts, and my uncles for God. As far as I know, every one of them are in heaven. As far as I know. Yeah, what a heritage. I'm part of that heritage. My dad is a part of my grandma Teasa's heritage. I'm a third, I'm a second generation, second generation Pentecostal preacher. My dad, my dad has over 40 years in ministry. I'm part of that. My sons are part of that as well. I think, I think about my mama, her heritage, and big mama taking her. I'm part of, I'm part of, I'm part of big mama's heritage. I'm part of grandma Teasa's heritage. That's, but who would have ever thought then that I would be where I am and who I am today? And it wasn't easy. I had my times. I had my problems. I had my falters. I had my running from God. I'm their legacy. And as my boys, they're my legacy and their legacy. You may be in place in life today where you're struggling like Leah. You've done your best, but life is not as complete as you wish it to be. You doubt yourself. Your looks are fading. It happens. Your kids are rebellious. It happens. For some of you, your husband's left you. Unfortunately, that happens. And you sit around and you wonder, why, Lord, why? Why all this? I want to encourage you this morning. Don't lose heart. You haven't lived long enough to see your legacy play out. You don't know. Your kids may not be living for God right now, but you don't know what will come. And if they're not, you never know about your grandchildren, what, what impact you will have on them because you're praying for them and you're being that witness before them. Don't give up. Don't give in. Don't doubt yourself. Don't say discouraged. Leah's life was anything but pleasurable. But God made something beautiful out of it and he seeks to do the same with yours. And this is why I want to close. I want to close with this right here. Here's, here. here's the ultimate legacy of Leah. It's an interesting fact that gives, that gives the explanation point to Leah's life. Revelation 21, at the very end of the Bible, you'll find that as the new heaven, the new Jerusalem comes to the new earth, that in this city there are 12 gates that are made of pearl, a whole pearl, an entire pearl. You know how a pearl's made, right? Pearls made when something uncomfortable gets inside of an oyster. And so what they do is they, to, to make it comfortable, they cover that piece of sand or whatever it is with the same uh, mother of pearl that, that the shell is made out of. And it makes a beautiful pearl. So just think about that as, as I'm explaining this about the New Jerusalem. There's 12 <laughs> gates in this, 12, in, in this New Jerusalem. And Leah's kids have their names on half of those gates. Think about that. Half the gates of the new Jerusalem, when the millennium reigns over and we are in the new, new earth and the new Jerusalem descends from heaven and, it, and God sets up his kingdom on the new earth, 12, six of those 12 gates are going to have the names of Leah's children on them. So when we enter, as the Bible tells us, that we will enter in there, the nations will come and go through these gates. You may be, go through the gate of Reuben. You may go through the gate of Simeon. You may go through the gate of Levi. You may go through the gate of Judah, Ishkar, Zubalim. You may go through any one of those gates. Maybe one of the other ones, but you have a great possibility to literally enter through a gate that's named after one of the sons of Leah. What a legacy. That forever and ever. Now we know that that's named after those tribes, but they came from Leah. They came from Leah. 
Leah. She suffered a lot through many great irritations of life, things she didn't ask for or want, but six of those gates are named after her kids, a tribute to her life. Not just her boy's life. It's a tribute to her life because of her trust in God and persevering and walking and honoring God. Leah's lifelong suffering eventually led to eternal grandeur that she never thought would happen. Nowhere could she have thought that would what would be take place in heaven. So what will stand in heaven as a tribute to what you are going through right now? It's tough being a mom right now. It's always been tough, but it's really tough right now. It's really tough with everything that's going on. Especially in our area with all that we've been through the last four years. But what will be your tribute? What, what will be in heaven as a tribute? What pearls will be fashioned for the adverse, painful circumstances of your life? I love it. Leah began a marriage with a husband who didn't love her. But she never stopped loving him and being faithful to him. And at the end... He loved her more. So don't let difficult hardships or sorrows upend you. Your life has meaning. Mom, your life has meaning. You have the potential, regardless of, even, even as your kids grow older. I know some, some of you mamas, your, 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 your adult parent kids came to be with you. They're, they're parents themselves. You still have an influence in your kids. I want to remind you, children, that it says to honor thy mother and thy father. It doesn't say do that until you get 18 and move out. Honor, honor thy father and thy mother. So I want to encourage you today, moms. We don't know, do we? My grandma Roberts, my grandma T's, they had no idea that one day I'd be a Pentecostal preacher pastoring in the great metroplex of Bear Creek. No idea. But nonetheless, here I am. Here I am. And you may be saying, but my kids aren't serving God right now. It's God's will that none should perish. So it's God's will for your children to be saved. Pray. Pray. Sister Bonnie, don't you give up. You keep praying. Amen? Yeah. One day Terry's going to give his heart to the Lord, right? <laughs> no, you know, we had that conversation earlier. You keep, don't give up. Amen? Moms, thank you for being who you are. Thank you for, don't, you don't know what your legacy is. Only time will tell. It may not be in your lifetime. Now to the kids, what kind of legacy? You are their legacy. You are their legacy. What does your life say about the investment that your mom has made in your life? How are you honoring your parents? How are you honoring your mom? What impact are you? What part, what part of your mom's legacy are you going to play? How is her legacy going to continue through you? See, only time will tell. Only time will tell. Amen. Stay with me all across this room if you would. Matter of fact, this is what I want. If your parents are in the house, if your mom rather is in the house, I want you to go to your mama. Go to your mama. We do this almost every year, if not every year. Go to your mama. We're going to make room. I'm not going to be long. We're about to close. I'm going to close in a prayer, but I want to close with a blessing. I want to close with a blessing. I want you to bless your mama. I want you to get close to her. Hold her hand. Put your arm around her. Lay hands on her in a godly way. In a godly way. Some still moving. If you're here today and your mom has gone on to heaven, thank God for the... Thank God. Thank God for the influence she's had in your life. I'll say this. If you had a mama that wasn't the best example, that's a reality... What do you do about that, Pastor? Thank the Lord that you're not going to be like her. And I don't mean that in an ugly way. I don't mean that in an ugly way. What the enemy meant for bad, God can use for good. Father, I thank you today, first, for your presence that we have felt in this room, Lord, as we lifted up voices in celebration and worship of you, God. You're such a good Father. Oh, God, you're a gracious God, a God of full of love and mercy and grace, Lord, full of blessing, God. Thank you so much, Father, for visiting him with us today, Lord, and entering this place of worship, God, inhabiting our praise, God. I thank you, Lord, for the lives that have already been touched, God, through our worship, through the presence of your Holy Spirit. Now, Lord, I speak a blessing right now over these ladies, over these moms today. God, I have no idea the burdens they carry. I have no idea, Lord, the pressures, 
that are put on them are not put on us as fathers, Lord. They're, they're really not, God. I acknowledge that, Lord. That God, somehow, some way, Lord, there's, there's a closer bond between a mom and a child in most cases, Lord. And, and Father, I just pray today that these moms, Lord, that you encourage them today, Lord. The fact is, there's moms in here today, Lord, that their children have preceded them, and their hearts are heavy. God, I know, I know their hearts are heavy because God, all this reminds them of is what they don't have any longer. But Father, I'm here to tell them today, Lord, that they still have that legacy, God, and that legacy is now in your presence, God. And, and Father, that you, God, because of their lives, Father, that's why their children are there with you. God, thank you for godly moms. Lord, there's some here today who are struggling with their kids because, Lord, for, for what has happened in their life or what's going on in their kids' lives, God, the disarray, the, the dismantling of their lives, God, the dismantling of their faith in you, God, and the, the things that this world is attracting them, Father, that's drawing them, Lord. And God, I pray that you bless these moms, that they do not give up on prayer, do not give up on speaking their names before your altar, God. Lord, you, you God, there's something about a mama's prayer. Lord, you honor that mama's prayer. And Lord, they love their children, God, closer to the way you love us than any other relationship in this world, Father. Nothing comes closer to the love of a mama other than yours. So bless them, Lord. This day, God, may they be blessed, Father. God, greatly, and day forward. Lord, for those today that their mamas, God, have already gone on to glory. Lord, remind them that they, their mamas live on in them. Their mama's legacy is still well alive, God. And Lord, you're still working through their mama's influence in their lives, God. May they honor their mamas. God, may they honor, honor their mamas today, Lord, as they live their life for your glory. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Give that mom a hug. Tell her you're going to wash her car today, clean her house, take her to dinner. Come on. Love on your mama today. Give your mom a big hug.